Hi, I'm Dave Gardy from Maritime TV from our studios here near Washington, D.C. for this special presentation, the second in a series about the ship, the Meredith Victory, and its role in Korea. In uh, the 70th anniversary of the Incheon invasion of Korea, uh, two USMMA grads and officers aboard the SS Meredith Victory talked about the battle, the typhoon that preceded it. Now we're talking about the largest humanitarian rescue by a single ship in human history, saving 14,000 North Korea refugees fleeing the Chinese. So now I'm going to turn it over to the moderators for today's presentation to discuss this, Father Sinclair Oubre. Well, thank you very much, Dave, and thanks to Maritime TV for letting, uh, letting us do this program again. I want to welcome with me the uh, director of the Apostleship of the Sea of the United States of America, who I work closely with here for the cause of uh, Captain LaRue and Brother Mariners. I want to welcome with me also is Burley Smith, who is the third mate on the Meredith victory, both on the Incheon landing as well as uh, the evacuation from Hunam. Also, Merrill Smith, who was a third engineer on the, on the ship during that same time. Also with us is Phil Lacavera, who is just completing and publishing today uh, a 450-page biography of Captain LaRue, Brother Marinus, which will be just so instrumental in the efforts that we're doing for the cause of sainthood. And so I've listed out some ideas of where I'd like to take this conversation because we're very familiar with the uh, evacuation of, of the Meredith victory, putting the refugees on board. But there's some background to that to get the flavor to it, especially with Burley and Merle, and hopefully uh, 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 Bob Lunny, who was the staff officer, is going to be able to join us also for the program. But uh, Burley and Merle, so you did the Incheon landing. Then you go back to Yokohama, and then you start shuttling military supplies from Japan to Korea, back and forth. And then all of a sudden we have this situation where the uh, uh, where the uh, the Chinese have entered the war. The Chosen Reservoir situation has taken place. Things start heating up really quickly. So, what happened? What was the first information that you had that things were changing and that this shuttle service that you guys were doing was was uh, turning around and being different? Merle, if you want to. Merle, can you give us your recollection on that? Go ahead. Well, the, as I say, the first, we had done uh, Yokohama Incheon, Tokyo Incheon, and then we ended up in Incheon on the 23rd of November, uh, went back to Yokohama, and the next trip was to supply our troops up in Hangnam, who were then up to the Yalu River. But at that point, the Chinese had come in in November and early December and were pushing us out. So instead of being able to discharge in Hangnam, they chased us out, sent us down to Pusan to discharge. And by this time, there was chaos. There were eight lines of defense. Uh, shut me up if I'm going into too much detail. But this also, Phil, came out of the, uh, the book I was referring to. At this point, the number one line of defense that we had established was up in the north, up near the Incheon, uh, the uh, reservoir, um, the Chosin Reservoir. They had broken through and were pushing us back to the second line. These lines went all the way back down to line number eight below the Han River at Seoul. And as we were being pushed down, finally they saw that they were going to have to get our troops out of North Korea, and the only way they could do it was through the port of Hangnam, which we still held, because to get them down overland was impossible. And that all happened, the first we knew about it was uh, in Hung Nam on December 11th, when we were told, get out, the enemy is coming. So you were you had gone to, you were in Hung Nam on December 11th, supposedly to discharge cargo. Uh, where did you take that cargo? What we hadn't been able to discharge in Hung Nam, we took down to Pusan. And we were in Pusan for about a week. And then on the 19th, because they were screaming for ships. There were about 197 ships. Um, these are civilian ships that the MSTS that we were sailing for, the Military Sea Transportation Service, about 197 ships, according to one list, 
that were called upon to go up and help evacuate, number one, our military, but then number two, these suddenly 98,000 refugees who came flowing into Hung Nam alongside our troops waiting to be evacuated. When you were discharging and then getting, you were being sent back up to Hung Nam after discharging, did you, did you anticipate picking up people or were you anticipating picking up military cargo? Good question. I noticed this morning for the first time that in my own, uh, my own log entries that I got out of this monstrous, wonderful book here, um, I say that we're heading north to load cargo. So obviously the sentiment at that point was we were going up to load cargo to keep it away from the Chinese. So Merle, during this time period, as you go to Hung Nam and then you guys in the engine room are told, no, we're going to Busan to discharge, what were your thoughts taking place at that as you're hearing about the Chosen Reservoir, the retreat of the 1st Division of the Marines and the, and the UN forces heading to Hung Nam? What were your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I was getting most of my information out of the, out of the deck crew, mainly from my friend Barley. Uh, obviously, you don't see too much when you're down the engine room, except when I'd come off watch, I'd try to see all that I could. Uh, but uh, I, I, I knew, I felt I was part of the action, let's put it that way, even though it wasn't visible to me down below decks. But I knew we were playing a, an important role, obviously, in keeping the engines going and the generators going and keeping the ship functioning. And... Uh, and just waiting day by day where we'd wind up. If, if I could interject here, Merrill has always claimed, Father, that the reason he and I have each reached this advanced age of 90 plus is because he was down in the engine room making such pure water for us to drink. <laughs> that's right. That's why he has such longevity. <laughs> I, uh, instead of drinking uh, water out of the, uh, you know, the sea around Japan or Korea, I purified it, and then they drank it. That's, that's the only reason. The teeth also, right? The only reason he's in his 90s. Don't let him tell you. <laughs> that's right. Well, let me let me bring Phil in. Phil, in your research on the biography of, of Captain LaRue, uh, what did you find? In, in, did you find anything in regards to his thoughts during this time? Well, to... unfortunately, the... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, the... the um... Several times during the 1950s, uh, there is a reference to a, uh, a log or a journal that Captain LaRue kept. Uh, there are some quotations from it. Sometimes they're attributed to the, uh, to the deck log. But it's almost certain that the, the very poetic uh, comments that he made later were not in the deck log. They probably were in some uh, individual journal, which unfortunately is lost to history. Um, what what uh, what does occur several times in interviews, though, are he states his thoughts, which clearly were um, of great sympathy for the people he was experience he was uh, seeing uh, in uh, in extremists. Yep. Yeah. So so uh, getting so early and Merle, you guys sail from Pusan, head back up to Hungnam. Uh, but there's there must have been some time at Anchorage uh, outside the harbor because the the military attaché the the army fellow who invited Captain Larue to take his ship in had to visit the ship during that time, right, Burley? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, we anchored at 7:47 p.m. on Wednesday, December 20th, um, using the starboard anchor. Uh, opened the hatches, and this is where I'd made the entry at 8 o'clock in, in the logbook, the ship's log, awaiting orders to load cargo. So we're sitting out at Anchorage number 46 in Hungnam Bay. Uh, the crew, our own crew, is opening up the hatches, the five hatches, and we're waiting to go alongside and load cargo as of the evening of uh, December 20th. <laughs> And Merle in the engine room during that time, because you guys were on the same watch, weren't you? Merle, yes. third engineer, you were on the same watch. Well, when you're in a situation like that and you're in the engine room, you're not really utilizing your engine's full power, but you've got to keep the engines ready, which is a difficult situation when you're not going or anywhere or moving the ship. 
So you try to keep the turbines warm and ready the moment the bridge wants some speed and they open it up to the turbines. And that's what you worry about all the time is when are they going to want, want power to the engines? You got to be ready. That's a never ending problem in the engine room. Merrill, do you remember what watch you were on? Eight to 12. Eight to 12, yeah. We were on the same watch, Father, eight to 12. Yeah. And I used to, I used to envy, I used to envy, uh, you know, my friend here, because on a sunny day, he'd be sitting up on a railing watching the ocean. And, uh, you know, I'd be down in the engine room. <laughs> Quite a contrast. That's the reason that I went into the deck. And then he, and then he, no, then, then his big complaint, his big complaint was there's smoke coming out of the smoke stack. <laughs> So, Burley, after you guys had got an anchorage at that point, do you remember the uh, military uh, attache or the, the Army um, colonel who came on board to talk to Captain LaRue about going in and taking up the, the uh, refugees? Well, um, we anchored, as I say, at 7 p.m. Uh, on the 20, on Wednesday. Uh, we sat there and we did nothing all through the night or the next morning, Thursday the 21st. And that, oh, the entire day of Thursday the 21st, we just hung at anchor. So we're in there all day long the next day. And at 6.50 in the morning, we had an LCM, one of the small landing craft, landing craft men, brought out rations for a thousand men. Presumably, Merle, we were running out of food. And if I recall, at that point, we in the officers' mess were eating uh, powdered eggs and, and hot dogs out of cans. Do you remember that? That's right. You're correct. So that must have been food for the ship. A, a thousand men is what they called it, rations for a thousand men. Uh, that day, we were still doing nothing. So this is day three. Uh, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, we lowered the lifeboats. We had two lifeboats, ran the engines to make sure they worked still thinking we were going to go in and load cargo. A pilot came aboard that day, uh, Friday at 3.40. We brought up the anchor and we came alongside this other ship, a Liberty ship to North Cuba, docked alongside him at five in the evening on the Friday, that's December 22nd. And then by 21.30, we began by 9.30 that evening, Friday evening, December 22nd, we began loading the refugees at number four and five hatch using our crew and our own cargo gear. And number one, two, and three hatch, we had them coming up over the side on ladders. So we threw the early, night. Early at that point, let me ask you a couple of questions. One, uh, your pilot that came on board, was he a Korean pilot or an American pilot? You no, know, uh, the pilot, he, well, he could have been American. He could have been British. His name was Dawson, so I'm sure he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't Korean. Korean. And, and second, since you came alongside and docked against the North Cuba, uh, did, the, did the refugees come up the North Cuba and across? Or yes. did they? Did yes. They did? Yes. Yeah. Now, was there any particular, you weren't on the bridge when y'all came into Hung Nam, did, were you? Uh, we arrived at Hung Nam at 4.32 in the afternoon, anchored at 7.47, uh, and I came on watch 13 minutes later after we got the anchor down. My watch started at 8 o'clock. For you and, and Merle, since y'all were off watch at that time, uh, were you were you on deck watching the entry into Hung Nam, or was there any recollections of, of the actual coming into the port? Because we know that uh, the, the well, if I was off a watch, I'd always go up on deck and see what was going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were y'all aware of the mines that were in the harbor at that time? And there is a note on that. And I'd forgotten about this until I read it again in our log. Friends on this, the third mate mentions as we're coming in on his watch, that was on the 12th to 4, that we had turned on as we arrived at the sea buoy, number one buoy that the Navy had planted when they swept the mine, the channel through the mines, that we turned on what they call the degaussing system. Merle, you remember that? They had this electronic system around the hull that was supposed to neutralize the mines. 
Oh, yeah, I remember that. I also yeah. remember a, a destroyer that came up alongside and gave us a, a hand-drawn map exactly. of the minefield. Remember that? Yep, exactly. And I had to be on deck as we came in, um, Father, because we had a problem, as I think we've discussed before. Our radio operator, we only had one radio operator. He was ill. The radio telephone, for some reason, we never used, either because it didn't work or for security purposes. So our only communication was flashing light. And I was the only one aboard who was able to use the flashing light because I was right out of the academy. The other mates had been out long. And, you know, normally on a merchant ship, you, even in those days, you never would have used the flashing light with the Morse code. So, yes, uh, I'm sure Merle and I were both on deck coming in because you've got all these heavy warships off the coast a few miles out firing these monstrous shells over your head onto the beach and U.S. aircraft strafing the Chinese. And you could see the fires in the, in the hills where the Chinese were. So, yeah, it was something you didn't want to miss. Especially when at Missouri, every time she'd shoot, she'd shoot right over her head. Remember? Yeah, yeah, sixteen you inch. Look, you could look up. You could look up and see the shells going through the air. Remember that. So Merle, when you were on watch and you were loading, uh, you were loading refugees. Let me take one step back. What was y'all's reaction when you pulled up along the North Cuba and all of a sudden discovered that you're not doing cargo, but that you're loading up people? I, I didn't quite hear that correctly. Yeah, Merle, I, what I said was, uh, what was your surprise or what were your thoughts when you suddenly realized that it wasn't going to be a cargo loading operation, but a, a human cargo operation at that point? Did y'all, was there any thinking about that or any reflections on, on behalf of your behalf? No, but I remember the, the GI coming aboard and wanting to know how many people we could take. And uh, we were all kind of flabbergasted. The captain didn't know. He just said, well, we'll take as many as we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, little did we know how many we would wind up with. Unbelievable. Now, Merle, did, when, when you, you saw those people, when you saw those strings of people waiting to get on there, remember, it was the winter time. Mm -hmm. And they had already wor worked, you know, for miles through the ice and snow. And they had suffered. Now they get on a ship, no heat, no water, no toilet facilities. Mm -hmm. it's it's close. Close. And I want to welcome um, Bob Lunny. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Hey, welcome. Hello, Bob. Glad, glad to be aboard. Hello, Bob. Yes, hey, there he is. Well, <laughs> my well, old buddy. Yep, Burl and Burl, Burley and Merle. And then we also have Phil Lacavara on this on this call also and Doreen Bado with the Apostles of the C USA. So um, Bob, just sort of help you catch up where we're at here. We've we've been talking about the process and, and so now the uh, the uh, Meredith Victory is tied up to North Cuba and in the process she's beginning to take on refugees. And the question I just asked. Burley and Merle, and I'll pass on to you because you were actually so involved with Captain LaRue at that time, uh, was you guys thought you were going to load military cargo, and all of a sudden you're uh, loading up human beings. What was your thoughts at that time? Or were you surprised at that hearing? Oh, at, at, at that time, um, we were accustomed to all sorts of changes. so. It was not surprising, but we followed through because we were functioning under Captain LaRue, who was a fine captain, and whose orders we respected very much. He was a very fine leader. So we received his orders and proceeded accordingly. There was no question about following his leadership. Mm -hmm. He was a fine man. And we respected his leadership very much. So when, and this is for, for Bob and at Burley, probably mostly. So this, the loading pro process took almost 24 hours or so to take place, which meant that it ran through everybody's watch at least twice. Uh, was there exhaustion among the crew members? What was your attitude? Is this, 
this flow of humanity just kept coming and coming and coming. Oh, I, I, I don't, I don't recall any uh, un, unusual concern. No, we were simply following the orders of our captain, uh, and that was our role aboard the ship. There was never any question as to following the orders of a captain aboard a ship. Uh, yeah, people always ask us, what well, was their discussion? Was there disputes? Was there argument? Did you argue with it? No. Aboard ship, it's a, a unit cohesion. It, you, you follow through. One man runs the ship and you follow his orders. So that's what we did. And it was understood by all of us. I trust it's still understood today. The captain of the ship runs everything and you follow his orders. That's what it's all about. Otherwise, you're not gonna have a functioning ship. Uh, each one of us had our own duties and functions. We relied on everyone else to follow through on what they were supposed to do. And there's total reliance on every other member of the crew and officers. So it was never, in, in, at least in my mind, there was never any undue concern when he gave the orders to start loading the refugees. Burley, do you remember some thoughts from, from the loading process? Uh, yeah, I would, in answer to your question, Father, <clears throat> we began loading um, exactly at 21.30. So this was on my watch on the Friday evening, 9.30, commenced loading the refugees. Um, one, two, three, four, and five hatches. As I say, two hatches with our crew and um, two hatches with coming up ladders across the North Cuba. So from 9.30 at night until 8 in the morning, we began loading the deck, closed all the hatches. Sorry. Take it. Sorry about that. But we just came back with the doggy. So from 9.30 at night, uh, we had closed all the hatches by 8 the next morning. All the hatches were full. We began loading the deck, and then uh, the, we left the dock at 11.34. So the entire process took about for about 15 hours. Mm -hmm. now, the, here's, a little, here's a little bit of trivia when we were starting to load those people. Uh, I think it was a lieutenant came aboard <clears throat> and was making preparations on how many people we could take. Anyhow, we asked him, we said, look, because he had been fighting and coming, you know, eating army rations. We said, what would you like to eat? Anything. We'll make anything. And he said, I'd like an onion. We said, an onion? He said, I've been thinking about an onion for weeks. <laughs> That's all he wanted was an onion. We got him an onion and he ate it like an apple. I still remember that. So we we loaded all everyone was loaded up, and at um, 1100 hours or so, you guys um, set sail. Now did the the North Cuba follow you out at that point? No, she did not. Um, as we had come in, we banged the North Cuba. There's a note in the log that we bashed her as we came alongside the dock, but we couldn't see any bad damage. And as we departed, we had the same pilot. Captain, uh, pilot was Dawson, Captain da Dawson. He took us out and uh, the North Cuba was still at the dock. So we were definitely not the last ship away. And I don't know when North Cuba finally did leave. We were one of the last, definitely. Yep. My memory was the North Cuba was loading material and supplies and some of it was being for us transported across the deck of the north cuba a uh, ramp had been built over the north cuba and the refugees proceeded over the north cuba on this ramp into our ship mm -hmm. that's right bob exactly um as I said, the, our crew was using the heavy lift gear um, at number four and, and at number five hatch, the normal gear. 
and they were loading crew on the uh, platforms, the wooden platforms that had been built using the wires, our own ship's cargo gear. And one, two, and three, uh, we were using uh, ladders, uh, platforms to get them up onto the North Cube and then ladders across to our ship. You're right, there were ramps built right across the deck of the Cuba. So did you use, did you use bat, um, slings and, and, uh, and nets to lower the, lower the crew members down into the lower holes? And no, not nets. Nets would have squashed them up pretty badly. What we tried to do, the mates, <clears throat> we were down in the between decks as we loaded each of the lower decks. Uh, they'd come down on these with the wire gear of our, we had these platforms. They were sort of, I would guess, 10 by 10 foot wire wooden platforms that had been built down on the dock. It was lifted by our cargo gear and brought right into the hatches. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That was so, at number four and five hatch. So at this point, you guys let go of the lines. Pilot Dawson takes you guys out. What happens over the two days or so from Hung Nam or the twenty, uh, the time that you sailed from Hung Nam to uh, to Pusan? Uh, certainly, the stories have been told about you know the hunger, the thirst, the crew member, the for the for the refugees. Uh, what were some of the things that were taking place? What was the weather, the seas? What was it? How cold was it out there during that time, especially for the poor people on the deck? Merle's got a, a story of somebody coming through his porthole, I think, to get some something one night. No, Merle? Couldn't catch it. I say yeah. you've got a story of one of the refugees who got up as far as the porthole of your cabin and That's stuck right. his hand in. What was he looking for? Yeah, I can't hear the question. Yeah, I, I think you said there was a guy who came looking for water because there was no water down in the hole. Yeah, right. No water. Water. Uh, I, I remember on that departure, we were, it, it took some seas. Some of the spray, uh, as we were underway, came over the the uh, uh, the deck, and we uh, we issued some tarpaulin or canvas for some of the people huddled on the on the weather decks. We were, we were very lucky, Bob, weren't we? Because uh, in the logbook here, I noticed 8 o'clock on uh, Saturday night after we had left the dock, the, in the log entry, I've got light airs, cloudy, good visibility, uh, calm sea, but colder than hell. I mean, I didn't put colder than hell in the logbook, but the cold no. the worst enemy. We had sort of... According to the log, we had light northwesterly breezes most of the way down to Busan. So the sea wasn't a problem, just light rolling. And that was very fortunate because with all the people on deck, it would have been horrible. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you have the temperature from the log at that night? Our deck log doesn't show the temperatures. Okay. Yeah, that's quite interesting. So you make it down there. Were there a lot of ships in Pusan when you arrived in Pusan on the on 24th? Yeah, uh, there certainly were. We arrived, um, we anchored in Pusan when we arrived. Remember, we still don't have any radio contact. So coming into Pusan was a surprise to everybody there. And we came in and we anchored. And then we had a naval, we anchored at um, one o'clock in the afternoon on the Sunday, Christmas Eve. And then by three o'clock, we had a naval officer aboard um, with orders to send us somewhere else because they didn't want 14,000 smelly refugees coming into their tidy little town. Um, the signal station at 5.45 there, so we're lying at anchor from the time we arrived, which was 12.30 noon. At five o'clock, the signal station finally ordered us by blinker light to come alongside that evening at uh, 11 o'clock at night. So the skipper had us start removing the hatch covers at 6 p.m. and assuming that we were gonna be discharging the refugees there, presumably. Uh, we came into the dock at 8.30, at 8.37, Pier 2, 
at 11.30, the wounded were taken ashore. Bob might remember how many wounded we had. We had about 17. 17 wounded. And um, at midnight, they began bringing rice aboard in these big GI cans, boiled rice. And in the log, I've got light westerly breeze, fine, clear weather, army MPs at the gangway and all about the ship. Uh, by, we fed the refugees all night, they're just dipping their hands into the buckets. Completed feeding the refugees by 7.30 in the morning, Christmas morning. And by 9.35, they had the pilot aboard. And uh, again, an, an American pilot. Um, we left the dock, and uh, by 10.54, we departed from the port on the way down to Kochi. Oh, wait a minute. Can you imagine, can you imagine you've got a ship full of 14,000 refugees who've been suffering, and now they get to Busan and they think they're going to get off. And then at the last minute, they're told, hey, you're not getting off here. We're going down to the... That had to be a heartbreak in every one of them on there. Now, in, in um, Bill Gilbert's book, uh, Ships of Miracle, he talks about the, the arrival in Pusan, and he also says that there were some uh, suspected spies uh, or communists who were taken off the vessel at that point. Do you have any comment about that? One of the articles in this monster book I was telling you about uh, one of the English articles by the military mentions a Chinese um, saboteur who was with the Koreans, the North Koreans coming aboard in Hong Nam. And it says that he was with a group of 16 North Korean MPs or security guards who came aboard. And that this guy was only discovered when our steward noticed that uh, 16 was the, the number of meals he was supposed to prepare, and there were 17 guys that he was having to feed. And that this, it sounds like an improbable story, but they, they say that's how they discovered this Chinese fellow and put him in irons. Hmm. Early, what is the, the book that you're referring to? Doreen, this is something that, um, was done by the Koreans. It's all in Korean except for the documents uh, that are the military documents and uh, congressional things and pictures of Bob Lunny here down in Washington. Uh, Sailing for Life is the English title. It's a marvelous book. It's got the most complete history you can imagine of what was going on both at the uh, Far East headquarters with MacArthur and with General Almond's headquarters 10th Corps, 8th Army, and uh, back in Washington. It's really wonderful. But it's all in Korean is the problem. <laughs> it would be much easier if we had somebody to read it to us. So, Bob, let me ask you, and, and Burley and Merle, you can add to it. So, so you get to GOG, you discharge the refugees. How long did it take you to discharge all those folks? Because it took you 15 hours to put them on. Um, did you clean the ship at that point? And then what did you guys do for the next couple of months after uh, Joe G? Oh, uh, well, we, we commenced cleaning up uh, at, uh, at the island, Koji. And then we went on to, uh, from there, direct to uh, uh, Busan. And uh, we were cleaning up at Busan. And then from Pusan, we went to Sasebo. My, my memory is pretty clear in that regard. And we finished cleaning up the ship in Sasebo. Sasebo, Japan. Yes, yep. So we had a, a, a full load of people uh, in the middle of a wall, and we were able to safely discharge them at the island of Koji Do and got up to Busan and then to Sasebo. So uh, it was a fairly successful mission, but um, it was in very dangerous waters at that time. 
So when did you guys sign off for the Meredith victory? Because you joined the ship, what, back in June? Uh, I remember signing off when we got back to uh, um, the state of Washington, I believe. I forget the name of it. What's the major city up there? And Seattle, uh, Seattle Se Bob is where we signed off. Did they recruit the ship and, and uh, send her back to, to Korea, or what did they do? The ship went back to Korea with uh, Captain LaRue, and I, I believe, Merle, that the uh, chief engineer, the American Indian, what was his name? Do you recall the chief? Oh, engineer? yeah, Brady. Uh -huh. uh, I think he stayed on. The skipper stayed on. I don't know who else stayed on, but the three of us all bailed out the father. Yeah, mostly everybody left. Kevin, I'm here. You all spoke about how, in a, in a sense, you were calm. Uh, you were just following the orders of the captain, and you just did your job. What was the sense that you had about uh, Captain LaRue? Was he very calm as as he realized he was going to be bringing on these all these 14,000 refugees? Or what was his attitude like at that time? Uh, I'll speak for when I, when I used to see him. I used to go in the ward room because I was in the engine room and really didn't deal with him as much as somebody up in the deck like Burley. But uh, at dinner time, uh, the captain would always be present. And I was always impressed. Uh, you know, you, you were used to see captains using all kinds of profanity and that, but with Captain LaRue, you just knew that you had to be a perfect gentleman when you're around him because he didn't appreciate that sort of talk. And uh, it was quite an education having him there and expressing his concern about the refugees. He, Captain LaRue was a man of quiet demeanor. Uh, he never had to raise his voice in my memory. Uh, we, the crew and the officers respected him. Um, because of his mannerism, his leadership qualities, and his general attitude. He treated us all very fairly, and uh, he, had the, he had the respect of the officers and the crew because of his leadership qualities. Burley, you got any co uh, last comments? Uh, you were just asking what we did after Koji. Uh, basically, we left Koji... Um, um, came back to Pusan. It was only three hours from Koji up to Pusan. We arrived in Pusan again on the 26th of December, absolutely filthy. Um, we started, uh, we stayed at anchor in uh, Pusan uh, all day, the 27th. They didn't know what to do with us again, and we were in terrible, filthy shape. Uh, they brought us alongside in the morning on the 28th of December. We hit the dock this time. Um, the pilot was a different chap, another American named Biang. Uh, we hit the dock, but didn't make a big dent in the side of it. And then we had the deck crew start cleaning the hatches, and three gangs of stevedores came aboard to discharge all these drums of aviation fuel that we had down in the hold of number two and three hatch. So they discharged that uh, during the afternoon of December 27th, and we finished that on the 29th, on the 29th in fact. Um, no, the 28th. So we then uh, we finished up on the 29th. So we were there for three days in Pusan after Koji, getting rid of the last of the cargo we had. And we had cleaning gangs aboard, as well as our crew cleaning the hatches. But then mm -hmm. there was still so much human feces and stuff that they hadn't either gotten to or didn't want to get to that, as Bob says, we sailed over to Sasebo, which was only about, um, it was exactly 10 hours across to Japan. And we anchored there. Um, and finally, after about four or five days in Sasebo, dumping all of the manure into Sasebo Harbor. We didn't go alongside the pier at all. They wouldn't let us. 
We then sailed uh, for Seattle, and uh, we sailed from Sasebo on the 4th of January, got back into Sasebo, uh, back into Seattle. It would have been about 12 days, so it would have been about the 16th of January that we got back in and paid off in the uh, in Seattle. Well, that's a, that's an interesting chapter that's there. I want to bring, with the last couple of minutes that I have, I'd like to bring Phil back in. Uh, Phil, tell us the story of your project because it, it, it covers this area and much more. Well, I, I um, am a life member of the Naval Institute, U.S. Naval Institute, and uh, uh, about uh, two years ago, I was reading uh, uh, the February issue of Proceedings magazine, and there was a little note in there from um, Rear Admiral uh, J. Robert Lunny, U.S. Naval Reserve, retired, commenting on a story that had been uh, printed the uh, previous December about an event in Korea. And Bob talked about the, um, the Meredith victory and Captain LaRue and... Um, the fact that he had uh, left the Merchant Marine after this remarkable accomplishment and became a Benedictine monk. And so I uh, was able to find Bob through the magic of the Internet, and, and uh, he and I corresponded. And then I got to spend some time with him and then with uh, Burley and decided that this was definitely something that needed to be retold 20 years after Gilbert's book. Uh, because there's a lot more to tell, uh, more, much more about LaRue's life and much more about the context of the uh, evacuation and the re rescue in Hungnam. So uh, it has been a year and a half of my life that has been an absolute delight to try and uh, put this down on paper and on Kindle so that uh, more people can know about it. Well, that's great. And, and what is the, what's going to be the name of the book? The name of the book is The Mariner and the Monk, and the subtitle is Captain LaRue, Brother Marinus, and the rescue at Hungnam. And it, it'll be available any day now or any minute now on uh, as Amazon Kindle. And uh, next week, in time for the um, anniversary, it'll be available uh, in paper. That, I'm excited to see that. And I can speak uh, as part of the apostleship of the CUSA, which is the petitioning organization for the for the cause of Father LaRue, of Brother of Brother Marinus and Captain LaRue, that the work is going to be just so very, very, very important. Uh, I just want to check real quick. You were saying, you know, with the Kindle version, you can do updates. With some of the stuff that Burley's been talking about and access to the log stuff, are you going to uh, sort of work with that and see if there's some a uh, couple it's, of up there? It, it's already in there. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. So it, it'll it's, it's it was it's very reassuring to hear. That what Burley has in front of him is consistent with what I wrote. <laughs> Otherwise, it'd be a problem. <laughs> so I really want to thank uh, Phil, Bob. I, I really appreciate you coming and being part of this. You were such a witness to, to Captain LaRue and Brother Marinus as he was in the monk at, in the monastery, which was just down the road from Bronxville, where you live. Merle, great to have you back with me uh, to, to be on this show, as well as Burley. Uh, Dave, I, I truly appreciate all the great stuff that you guys always do at Maritime TV and being able to uh, host us for this special presentation. Doreen. I would just like to, to thank Admiral Lenny and Burley and Merle. You guys have uh, been tremendous in retelling this story and keeping this story alive and promoting uh, Captain LaRue and his work. But you guys were right there with him. And it's really important that we say thank you to each of you for your role in, in that, that very miraculous um, saving grace that you gave to those people 70 years ago. So thank you very much for all that you guys did. Doreen, one of, one of the things that Bob mentions, I think, carries through the whole trip, and I, I think uh, Merle would agree as well. The whole thing, although it sounds terribly exciting, in the retelling, it was pretty much all workaday, daily routine on the ship, and I think a large part of that was due to the fact that Larue was unflappable and had great confidence in both himself and the rest of his crew. And it, it was a funny thing; we didn't see ourselves involved in anything particularly spectacular. It was a job that was getting done, and I think Larue's 
leadership was a great part of what was happening. And I, and sort of as a closing word, I can certainly say as a U.S. merchant mariner myself, uh, we do great things, and it's just another day at work. And the crew, the crew of the Meredith Victory rescued 14,000 people. And then the next day, what do you have to do? Is you have to go clean the holes to get ready for the next cargo that goes along there. And it's just one day after another after another. And we never have an opportunity to step back and reflect upon the really great things that we did. Uh, one of the ships that used to call in Port Arthur all the time was the Manhattan. Um, before and after she made the Northwest Passage. But I'm sure the guys who sailed her across the Northwest Passage would say, you know, we were just doing our jobs at four to, four to eight, eight to 12, uh, day after day. And it's just, a, and it's really important to be able to step back and say, hey guys, you guys really did an important and great job. So Dave, thanks for letting us be with us uh, for this uh, 45 minutes or so today and being able to share the story. Thank you, Father, and thank you everyone for participating. We appreciate it. Uh, very, very good. This, we'll have this up, up in archive very shortly. Again, a fascinating story of the Meredith Victory, the 70th anniversary of the Christmas time rescue, the largest humanitarian rescue by a single ship in human history, 14,000 North Korean refugees fleeing the Chinese. For Maritime TV, thanks for watching this special presentation.